Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Rod Passman, and I am a cardiac electrophysiologist at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. The title of my talk today is Pill and Pocket Anticoagulation for Atrial Fibrillation. So what do I mean when I say pill and pocket anticoagulation? What we're talking about is targeted anticoagulation given only in response to a prolonged episode of atrial fibrillation. We're talking about time-delimited anticoagulation given only for 30 days after this prolonged episode. And we're talking about personalized anticoagulation given to those at the lower end of the chads vast scale and those with infrequent episodes of atrial fibrillation, either spontaneously as a result of autoconversion or as a result of rhythm control strategies, including antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. There are two pilot studies that assess the feasibility of this approach. In one, react.com, 59 patients were uh, implanted with uh, insertable cardiac monitors and reinitiated their previously prescribed NOAC or DOAC for 30 days after an episode of AFib lasting an hour or longer. In this study, there was a 94% reduction in the time on oral anticoagulation with no strokes and one definite TIA and two major bleeds both occurring off anticoagulation. The other pilot study, Tactic AF, enrolled 48 patients with dual chamber pacemakers or defibrillators. Here, the threshold for reinitiating anticoagulation was one episode of AFib lasting six minutes or longer, or a total of six hours over a 24-hour period. The initiation of anticoagulation lasted for 30 days, and here, a 75% reduction in the time on oral anticoagulation was observed with no strokes and no major bleeds. These two pilot studies enrolled 96 patients and they were followed for a total of 112 years. And while there are no strokes, right, these studies only assess the feasibility of these approaches. What it doesn't tell us is whether this approach is safe and how do we scale this approach to the tens of millions of people around the world who have no indication for a transvenous implantable device and where the use of an insertable cardiac monitor is simply not practical due to its cost and invasive nature. Of course, we're living in an era now where we can wear AF sensing devices. The current generation of smartwatches allows for passive AF surveillance using photoplethysmography with single lead ECG confirmation using the stem of the watch. So the question is, can we leverage these advances in both wearable technology and pharmacology with the rapid onset novel or direct oral anticoagulants and use pill and pocket anticoagulation for the population at large? The study we have designed is called REACT-AF. This is a one-to-one -one randomized trial, which will compare chronic novel oral anticoagulation therapy to watch-guided targeted novel oral anticoagulation treatment. The primary endpoint is a composite of stroke, arterial embolism, and death due to cardiovascular causes. And the secondary endpoint is a reduction in major bleeds. The study will enroll 5,500 patients at up to 100 US sites and is currently under review at the NIH. We are focused on a lower risk population. These are individuals who have no prolonged episodes of atrial fibrillation for several weeks prior to randomization on external monitoring. And we're focusing on a lower CHADS vast score patient, one to four for males and two to four for females. And of course, patients have to show that they can tolerate oral anticoagulation. Exclusion criteria include those with a pre-existing or future need for an implantable device. So we're essentially excluding patients with a low ejection fraction. And obviously patients who can't take anticoagulation or can't be in this study. Well, we spoke about why this uh, approach may be useful and why it may succeed, but why may pill and pocket oral anticoagulation fail? Well, AFib may simply be a marker for things like left atrial myopathy, a local hypercoagulable state and inflammation, and prior studies have shown a temporal dissociation between when the AFib occurs and when the stroke occurs. I would ask you, however, to look very closely at those studies because many of those patients may have had strokes that were unrelated to atrial fibrillation. They enrolled high-risk individuals and many of the episodes of AFib were very short in duration. A better way of looking at this is a case crossover study where you're comparing the risk of stroke following a prolonged episode of AFib compared to the risk of stroke in that same individual through some other period of time without atrial fibrillation. And when you do this sort of analysis, an interesting pattern emerges. If I draw your attention to the left, in this study taking place at the VA, 
which looked at patients with dual chamber ICDs. Those patients who had atrial fibrillation lasting more than five and a half hours had about a five-fold increased risk of stroke in the three weeks following that episode. More recently, we repeated that study in a much larger subset of patients, including those with pacemakers and implantable monitors, and again, found a five-fold increase in stroke within about a week of a prolonged AF episode. So while there are risks of doing the study, the implications of a positive study are significant. We could reduce the time on oral anticoagulation, and in doing so, reduce bleeding while still protecting against stroke. And we could do this at a reduced cost and improve quality of life. We could also change the indications for why we pursue a rhythm control strategy, moving it away from the current paradigm of improving symptoms and uh, in some patients with heart failure and towards a goal of eliminating or limiting the exposure to oral anticoagulation. With that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.